how many of you know what nard is? I'm not going to tell you either, so I just, I was wondering. Actually, actually I had a Facebook post a couple of days ago from a, a former uh, congregation member of mine who uh, said the, when I posted a picture about, um, please, please refrain from texting during the organ prelude, wait till the sermon starts to do that. Um, I had a friend post on that picture that the last time, the first time and the last time they used their phone in worship was in 2011 or 2010 on week five of Lent to Google what Nard was because the pastor was talking about what Nard was and that was me. But we're not going to talk about John this morning other than the fact that the perfume that Mary had was very expensive, right? It said it cost 300 denarii. How much is that? A denarii is one day's wage. That bottle of perfume cost a year's worth of wages. So figure out how much you earn in a year and think about spending that on a bottle of perfume. So now to what we're actually going to talk about. Have you ever wanted something so bad that you were willing to give up everything to get it. Anyone? Leave everything behind and follow after this one thing. It's hard to actually imagine that because there's there's things in our lives that we will give up quite a bit to go after. There's things in our lives that happen, some some by choice, some not by choice, that happen to us. And we give up our lives as we know them to follow after these things. Parents, when you have children, right? Life as you know it ends. Not to say that it doesn't get better at times. But (laughs) things are different when you have children, right? Life as you know it is not the same anymore. Things are different now and you have to live by a new set of standards. But there's there's this... This letter to the Philippians that Paul writes, this, and it's a beautiful book. The whole book is a beautiful book. Because it's written by a disciple who was going after Christians, right? Paul was, before Paul became Paul, he was Saul. And Saul was who? The biggest persecutor of the church. Or the biggest persecutor of those who followed the way. If you read the book of Acts, before Saul becomes Paul, Saul is at the stoning of Stephen. Saul holds the coats of those who create the first martyr for for the faith. Saul goes to the high council, those who gave the 30 coins to Judas to hand over Jesus, to ask for letters, to be able to arrest people who are Christians in different countries. And he travels all over the place to, to arrest these people. Saul was a Jew. Pure and simple. 100% through and through. And if anybody could count their heritage as something that would save them, it was Paul. Right? Because Paul is Saul. Even though he changed his name, he's still the same person. Right? And Paul gives us his pedigree, if you would, here in the third chapter of the book of Philippians. And Philippi, Philippi is a community that was grounded in Christ and headed the right direction. They had it all together. They knew what they were doing, but they still needed some help along the way, right? Do you ever have that when you know you're going the right way and you're right there with God and everything's going good, but you still need that oomph, that little kicking the behind every now and then to keep you going the right direction. But Paul writes this letter to this community and he gives his pedigree, right? If you buy a purebred pedigree puppy, it costs more. Right? Because it's better. If you can trace your lineage and well, yes, there's there's I get that. But people pay more for pedigree puppies. Because if you can trace your lineage, you're worth more. And Paul tells us here exactly why he's worth more. Right? He tells us. He gives us seven points to illustrate how his heritage makes him better than anybody else. 
He tells us that straight out here. He illustrates this perfectly to us. He says that he is a full member of God's covenant people. He was circumcised on the eighth day because God made a covenant with Abraham that all male offspring would be circumcised on the eighth day. And Paul was circumcised on the eighth day. So he's a full member of the covenant that God made. He's an Israelite by birth with all the rights and privileges thereof. He's a member of the people of Israel. He hails from one of the two tribes that are considered to be faithful to the covenant that God made with Abraham. And that's Joseph and Benjamin. It says that he was a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And he is a Hebrew born of Hebrews. There's no Gentile contamination in him at all. Right? He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. Those are all four things that happened to him because of his parents that he had nothing to do with. That he can claim as a reason why he's better than all of us. And then he's got three, which I always think are kind of questionable. But he's got three achievements that he did on his own. He practices the strict observance of the law. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He exhibits avid devotion to God as to zeal a persecutor of the church. This was a man who went after these people because they were taking down the temple, right? They were moving away from our God. They were pulling us away from worshiping the way we needed to be worshiping. And he is above reproach according to Pharisaic interpretation of the law as to righteousness under the law, blameless. That's the one I have a little trouble with. I don't think anybody's actually really blameless under the law. We all are sinners, right? We all fall short. So even Paul at some point probably messed up. But he counts himself as blameless under the law. He is the one who should be able to look at his heritage and count it as a way that he is going to be saved. That he has salvation. That he is counted among the righteous. He says all of this. And then with one little word, he takes it all away. What's the next word that he says? Yet? Is that how it's translated? I it's translated wrong then. But yes, he does say yet. Yet. That's a bad translation. The word is Allah. Not like Allah meaning God, but Allah, A-L-L-A in the Greek. Or Alpha, Lambda, Lambda, Alpha. Um, And it means but. He says all of this. I'm a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. Right? Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrew, a Pharisee of Pharisees, as to zeal, persecutor of the church, as to righteous under the law, blameless. But none of it matters. It's all rubbish. What is rubbish? Trash. Does anybody know what the King James Version is of that word? I would love to be able to get into this, but we have a mixed crowd, so I'm not going to get into what this word means. But let's just say that it's a street word that most of us would not allow our children to use. If they ever said it, we would ask them, why are they saying it? Paul's making a point here. I'm the one who can count my life as something that's going to make me right with God. But absolutely none of that matters. See, the question here this morning is what actually matters in your life? What is it that you're looking for? What is it that you're looking at? What is the focus of your life? There are so many things happening in this world right now that can easily pull us away from focusing on what we need to focus on. Day in and day out in this country, there's fighting. If you look at Facebook, my gosh, if you have a mixed bag of friends, you're going to see a huge difference of opinions on things that could pull you and sway you in many different ways. So what is your grounding and what is keeping you focused in this world? And Paul gives us a clear picture of what we need to focus on this morning. There's nothing in my life that I can count on. There's nothing in my life that's going to get me to heaven. There's nothing in my life that's going to save me and keep my relationship straight with God, except for the fact that I give everything up and look at and follow after Christ. To be as focused as Hebrews 12 says to be, to fix our eyes upon Jesus, 
the author and perfecter of our faith. In a, in a way, it's to be cross-eyed. Not cross-eyed in the physical thing of that your eyes actually cross and you can't see, but cross-eyed in the fact that when you look, all that you see is that. Because if you're not seeing the back of Jesus' head, you're in the wrong place. If Jesus is your co-pilot, you need to switch seats. Where is the focus of your life? And I'll be the first to admit that my focus is not always there. Because you know what? It's hard. Because our lives play in and we get going in our day in and day out things and, and we forget about who it is that, that brought us to this place. But God loved each and every one of us so much that he sent his only son to come into the world to save the world. Right? John 3.16. My bad quote of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that we might be saved. The more important verse there is John 3.17. Can anybody tell me what John 3.17 is? I've preached on this before. (laughs) Betty's going, yep. What? You're so close. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. (laughs) For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him might be saved. God did not send his son to condemn us, but to save us. God sent us His Son so that we could have the proper focus. God sent us His Son so that we would know that there's nothing that's going to keep Him away from us. Right? I should have set this up with the choir earlier. We could have sang a song. Do you know what? No, you don't know what song I'm talking about. It's actually a Marvin Gaye song. It would have been really cool. (laughs) Right? Ain't no mountain high enough Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough. Well, we can stop there. That's okay. <laughs> right? But that's the point. That's how God thinks of each and every one of us. There's no mountain so high. There's no mountain too low. There's no river that's too wide. That's going to keep him from coming to us. That's going to keep us from being the focus of, of his eye. He's focused on you. So where are you focused? What are you willing to give up for that relationship? Because he's given up everything. And all he's asking is for you to walk with him and to talk with him. And to allow him to lead your life and to show you the ways that he's sending you. So do what Paul did and give away everything in the past. Focusing not on anything that's come behind us, but what's in front of us. And hopefully that's Jesus. Hopefully that's the cross. Hopefully that's the things that are going to help us to maintain our focus on God and who he's created each and every one of us to be. So live your lives in such a way to show forward the love that he's already given to you. And keep your focus on the cross.